If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like us to continue putting out regular quality content, head over to patreon.com forward slash aircrewinterview where you can donate monthly and in return you will get rewards ranging from early interview viewings, bonus clips, credited as a producer and much more. Thank you and enjoy. I think it was um, recently, maybe last year, I can't remember the dates, but I think the U2s were over in RAF Fairford or Milden Hall, and mm. they basically woke up all the surrounding area because it's a loud <laughs> aircraft. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> we, it, it, it's not quiet. Uh, mm. For Yeah, uh, there, there are some folks out there, I'm sure we probably woke them up a little earlier than yeah. they wanted to be. Yeah. Awesome. So let's talk about the cockpit uh, in your time. So... What was it like? Was it was it still like the steam gauges, or did you have the digital screens? Talk us through that, Joel. So back in two thousand and five, uh, there was a major modification done to the cockpit, where we now have uh, flat screens, digital screens uh, that we use to operate the airplane. You know, uh, control attitude, you know, pitch heading, you know, uh, referencing all of that, as well as all of our navigation and engine instrumentation. Mm. So. It is all digital now, although there are some of the original, you know, switches and and some backup gauges that are analog. Uh, however, most um, uh, most instruments now are incorporated into three screens that are that are in front of you, and that becomes your primary means of of navigation. And obviously, we're going to talk about this suit because that look that thing looks really uncomfortable. Can you talk us <laughs> through it? Is it actually uncomfortable? You know, it's it's actually not uh, really? surprisingly. No, it's kind of just like wearing a big sleeping bag, you know. Okay, <laughs> but, right. <laughs> but so the the suits in themselves are are absolutely phenomenal. Um, they are actual space suits. You could, uh, you know, survive in uh, a vacuum environment, you know, like uh, outer space. They are the same suits. Wow, that okay. the shuttle astronauts used to use back in the early 80s um, and, you know, even through the, the program the, they were a little bit of a different color and they had a little bit of different uh, equipment on the suits where the shuttle astronauts did. But the fundamentals of the suit are still uh, the same. And mm-hmm. uh, originally the shuttle astronauts, um, the shuttle program borrowed our suits from us on the SR-71 program when they started flying before they had their own, as I understand it. Mm-hmm. So uh, those suits um, are actually made by David Clark, the same uh, manufacturer of the headsets, the green headsets, the you know no aviation way. headsets. But um, yeah, so uh, they're made in Worcester, Massachusetts, and um, they are they're absolutely phenomenal. We have some of the most you know well trained and and uh, and greatest uh, suit technicians that work with the U2 program um, because really there's nowhere else in the world that is utilizing spacesuits like the ones we have, um, you know, especially with the frequency at, at which we use them. So we really are kind of the center of, of, you know, the latest as far as, you know, space suit technology goes. I'm sure once you know, SpaceX and some of these other companies yeah. come out with some of their stuff, uh, you know, then David Clark's going to have some competition, but uh, as mm. far as, you know, uh, as far as what we are concerned about, um, uh, they're, they're phenomenal. So the suit itself is, um, it's, it's quite comfortable. It's actually several layers of material. There's a, you know, comfort layer, which is nice and soft. There mm-hmm. is a rubber layer, which provides the, uh, the, the, the air tightness. Um, it's kind of like wearing a big onesie, you know, uh, <laughs> And then there is a, every suit is custom fit uh, to the pilot. Um, there's a, a braided uh, type of, of um, it's almost, oh, it's hard to describe, but it's like a, a, a braided sleeve that you put on and it's contoured to your body. Oh. So every suit is individual, uh, individualized to the pilot. So it's not like um, a small, medium, large, you just... Not it's really. not really like a small, medium, large kind of right. thing. No, okay. your suit is your suit. Every pilot gets uh, two of them, and when all is said and done, you know, a setup costs about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or so for the for the suit itself. Wow. Um, 
there is elements to keep you cool. Uh, there's cooling that is, is plumbed throughout the suit. There's ventilation air uh, that is incorporated into the suit. So you have a constant inflow and a constant outflow, and you can adjust those. Um, and then there is the, the helmet, of course. Um, the helmet is probably the most complicated part of the, uh, of the whole uh, ensemble. Uh, you, of course, have the faceplate. Um, and the faceplate is is kind of interesting. You have 24 karat gold uh, wire that is uh, run throughout the faceplate itself, which is connected to a heater or not here. It, it itself gets hot and that plugs into the jet and that actually uh, provides defog. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that way, you, you know, it's, it's not going to fog up on you. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of your communications are linked into the helmet, and you have a spray bar around your face, uh, which provides 100% oxygen to uh, the areas just surrounding your face. The rest of the suit is all bleed air that is plumbed from the, uh, the aircraft engine um, and bleed air system. The oxygen that you're breathing around your, just in your face cavity there, um, is uh, liquid oxygen that we carry on board the airplane with us. So... Uh, there's regulators and there's all different, you know, little mechanisms inside the helmet just to make sure that everything uh, functions properly. There's backup uh, regulators just in case one of them malfunctions. And uh, uh, there's also probably the most important, well, next to the, the, the air is the feeding port. I was just about uh, to ask you about that, yeah. <laughs> How's that so work? there's there's a little there's a little one way valve on the uh, on the helmet itself, and that is where um, uh, that's where we eat and drink from. So uh, we have um, uh, in order to eat, um, it's the same uh, the same company that makes MREs, from what I understand, uh, makes what we call tube food, mm -hmm. and it's actually really delicious. There's probably 30 different types of, of food and it's just, it's ground up mush, like Gerber like baby, baby food almost. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same kind of thing, but we have, yeah. you know, cheesy polenta and bacon and we have oh, chicken wow. a la king and, and desserts, key lime pie, you know, uh, and caffeinated chocolate pudding. That's really the best stuff. Um, oh, wow. you get that, that jolt of, of caffeine, but we use, uh, it looks like a tube of toothpaste drilling, and there's a long straw on the end of the, on the end of the tube, and that straw goes into the feeding port, and on any given mission, you bring up five or six of those, and, and there's your meal right there. Bring a couple snacks, and, and uh, yeah, that's how you eat. Wow, that's awesome. Now, this might be a daft question, but have, like when you started flying with a helmet, did you ever have, have, have a niche and be like, scratch your helmet or something like that? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's probably the worst part about it is mm. that, um, you know, once in order to really avoid any kind of uh, issues with decompression sickness or, or getting bent, you pre-breathe 100 percent oxygen, uh, you know, for an hour prior to taking off in order to purge as much nitrogen from your blood as possible. And you from from that point, you really never want to open up um, you know, the helmet and breathe ambient air, because then you're going to be taking in more of that nitrogen that you tried to purge from your system. So to your point, you can't just open up and scratch your face mm -hmm. and, and, and whatnot, because you don't want to be breathing the air. And also if there were a rapid decompression of the cockpit in that moment, uh, you would not have the protection that the suit would, you know, afford, um, a lot of people don't realize this, but we don't fly around with the suit pressurized. Uh, okay. The suit is depressurized because when it's pressurized, it's very rigid and it's very difficult to move in and it's, it will inflate in a way that allows you to manipulate the flight controls, but really it's a backup system to a rapid decompression at altitude. Mm -hmm. um, above about 63,000 feet, which is called Armstrong's line, mm -hmm. uh, at that point at body temperatures, at pressures that low, your bodily fluids would literally boil out of your body. Oh, yeah. So as soon as cabin pressure would reach about 35,000 feet ambient, uh, the suit would begin to inflate, provide pressure you know, to the body and, and keep you alive uh, in order for you to be able to descend down to a survivable altitude and then you know, figure out what you were going to do from there. That's crazy. Crazy. So like... Yeah. like how much goes into you know just that one flight of you going up to uh, you know like 60 odd thousand feet is crazy 
even like this, like the small things of eating, like you don't think about stuff like that. And people, you know, if, unless you're an aviation enthusiast, you wouldn't even think about that. It's it's a tremendous amount of work, and it's it's a tremendous team that mm. goes into you know every mission from yeah. you know the maintainers that that are getting the airplane ready. It's it's uh, it, there is a a, a a huge amount of time that goes into preparing you know uh, to get an airplane ready for for mm -hmm. flight. Then the briefing and you know the coordination that needs to take place with the the chase car drivers, the mo what we call the mobiles. Uh, and then all of the suit technicians that are integrating you into the suit, the the suit when you when you're getting ready to go fly, you go into the suit integration room, and you change into your you know long johns and um, you put on the UCD. We can talk about that. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the UCD is uh, uh, what we call the urinary collection device. This is the question that everybody asks. Yeah, I, I was I, that's in my questions, <laughs> but you you describe it there. I, I, <laughs> Sounds horrendous. <laughs> um, so it, what everybody asks is, how do you go to the bathroom uh, in in the uh, in, in the U two? And the answer is, is uh, you can go number one. You can't go number two. Number right. two, you just have to hold it. Um, but we have something called the UCD, uh, which is uh, it, it stands for the urinary collection device. And if you think about it, it's uh, it's an it's it looks like a rigid condom, if you will, or mm -hmm. uh, an external catheter, mm -hmm. and it's tapered at one end, and uh, it's it's kind of a hardened but somewhat flexible latex material, and you uh, you put that on the best that you can and hope that it's not going to pop off, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and that actually connects to a hose that's inside the suit. That hose runs down the left part of your leg to about your knee. Uh -huh. At your knee, there is a valve that opens up, and that valve is connected to another hose that runs down the exterior part of your leg and will connect to a tank underneath the airplane. So when it comes time uh, you know, to relieve yourself in the airplane, it's actually quite the exercise. I, everybody's a little bit different, but um, you know, for me, I really had to kind of contort my body around a little bit. I had mm -hmm. to raise my seat up as high as it would go. I had to push the rudder pedals all the way back so I could almost be in like this, you know, standing like position. Um, and then you have to, you have to take the suit now and you have to increase the bleed air that's being ventilated into the suit and turn it up as high as it will go. So you mm -hmm. actually inflate the suit and create positive pressure, pressure yeah. inside the suit. And you want to close the exhalation valve so you're you're blowing up the suit so it's rigid at this point. So that now when you open this valve down by your knee, that is the only point of ventilation in the entire suit so you're creating a vacuum. Yeah. Okay. So then as you start to go, you want to be very careful and start very slowly. <laughs> Make sure there's no malfunctions that are, yeah, are occurring, yeah. which has happened before. Um, and you, it's a clear tube, so you can see the fluid running down, uh, you know, to the to the the tank below. And after after you see success, <laughs> you can uh, you can kind of start to to let things flow a little bit more uh, quickly. And uh, and that's that's kind of that. And then after you're done. It's a process of you know closing the uh, uh, of closing the valve, deflating the suit, and then wow. reconfiguring you know the airplane in a way that you can now you know be safe to fly it again. So it's it is a process. That's why it costs quarter of a million dollar for the suit. I'm guessing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, without uh, without um, I guess pulling the interview down a bit. But uh, how many times would you have to go in each flight, or is it? You hold it if you can. Oh, uh, I mean, you know, obviously it's it's all depending on the individual, but it was important that you kept yeah. hydrated throughout the flight. The hundred percent oxygen would really, um, you know, dehydrate you. And yeah, with new students especially, it's it's you know we laugh about it, we joke about it, but physiological needs of the pilot on long, high altitude, you know, missions like this are very demanding on the body. And learning how to survive and function 
inside one of these spacesuits. It's not something that we are normally, you know, accustomed to. So it, it is something we actually take a lot of time uh, to teach new students about. We will send them up on missions really just to get time in the suit and learn about how it functions. And, you know, part of the syllabus and, and learning how to fly the airplane is no kidding, learning how to function in the suit and be able to do things like eat and drink and go to the bathroom. So staying hydrated is very important. Um, you could usually get about three before the tank was full and right. then you had to switch to piddle packs or, or what have you. Um, it's funny because in, in, in cockpit working groups, every time we talk to Lockheed about what, uh, uh, what we want to see with the next version of the U2, the next generation changes that are made, almost every single time, number one at the top of the list is, is a bigger uh, urine tank. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All, the, all this technology, and yeah, we just need a bigger urination. Some of the most thing. incredible technology <laughs> on the planet, and one of the number one things that pilots want is, is a bigger uh, tank under, under, the, <laughs> under the cockpit. <laughs> awesome. Well, this we'll move on nicely from that. But uh, so, what uh, squadron were you based uh, with uh, from 2013 to th 2017? And what was your role as a pilot at this point? And what was the squadron's role? So the uh, the squadron is the 99th reconnaissance squadron, uh, based mm -hmm. out of Beale Air Force Base, just north of Sacramento, California. Yeah. And they are the operational squadron that currently operates the U2 around the world. Uh, we have various uh, operating locations that we function from around the world uh, on a regular basis and other locations that we operate from on a temporary basis. So it really just kind of depends mm -hmm. what the, the needs are of the U.S. government at that time. Um, but we can function from, you know, really anywhere around the world. And we have such uh, an incredible range and, uh, and endurance with the airplane that that it makes for a very, very versatile platform from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, responsibilities were, you know, as a pilot, you know, flying, flying the aircraft. Um, so I deployed uh, around the world with the airplane to every operating location that we do operate from. Uh, we uh, employed the airplane uh, across the Middle East and, and elsewhere and, and did uh, everything that we could to to collect the intelligence and uh, and reconnaissance that was asked of us, and I also later on became an instructor in the airplane, um, mm -hmm. helping teach new students, teaching classes, keeping uh, cr uh, pilots current and and spun up for deployment. Um, so really, just kind of a a, a mix of all of that uh, kind of stuff. And you, you probably won't be able to answer this, but I've seen like two types of U2. So uh, the few pictures that you sent me were, you know, the clean wing. But there's also one that looks like, you know, like a speed helmet on the back of, of the spine. Can you sure. tell me anything about that? So the on the spine, uh, the, 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 the large um, uh, bowl that you see there on the back of the airplane is uh, part of the data link system for the airplane. Oh, so okay. the way that the airplane functions is that as the, the pilot, um, we actually have very little in the way to do of, you know, operating the, the camera systems and some of the other systems on board the airplane. Yeah. Uh, many of those are operated from, from remote ground stations where they have large teams of people that are, are that have, you know, very, uh, you know, um, uh, phenomenal equipment that is able to connect to the airplane via data links. So mm -hmm. uh, that is actually um, uh, just a satellite dish, really. Uh, okay, that right. is, is um, uh, we're able to, to connect to one of these remote ground stations uh, somewhere around the planet and be able to, to operate autonomously. Mm -hmm. So that way we don't have to be connected to anybody um, on the ground nearby. So you can either tell me this or not, but uh, <laughs> did you ever fly in any operational regions, you know, during the, the Gulf, um, uh, over Iraq, Afghanistan, anything like that? Sure, yes, um, I did. I served, uh, I, I've flown the airplane all around the world, uh, to be honest with you, from east to west, but I did spend the majority of my time uh, operating uh, in uh, and around both Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us what you did there? 
<laughs> I could tell you, but then I'd have to kidnap. There you um, go. We got the, we got the quote. <laughs> really, really, the 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 mission behind the airplane is to provide strategic reconnaissance to um, the U.S. government. So mm -hmm. we are are um, we're we're both a strategic and a tactical asset, meaning. We will take off and we are able to collect intelligence on things where we might want to, as a, as a military, act on in the future and to help the commanders um, provide kind of a, a, a picture of what is going on, how they're progressing. You know, that's, that's one of the primary tools of the, of the airplane is that strategic asset. There is also the tactical elements of the airplane where... Um, you know, a lot of people ask us, well, how come satellites just don't replace, you know, the U-2? Well, satellites, you know, have to, if they're not in geosynchronous orbit, you know, it takes 90 minutes for them to, you know, go around the planet to get another shot. Whereas if there is something going on, let's say there's some troops in contact on the ground in Afghanistan, and uh, we need to be able to provide the elements on the ground as well as the strike aircraft information about where the bad guys are located we are able to proceed you know to a target spend time over that target provide that information in real time over the target you know with other intelligence assets using some of the equipment that we have on the airplane to share that information among all of the different players and then from there the strike assets are able to move in and, you know, take out uh, the bad guys, if you will, and, and kind of make that all happen. So we can kind of play both roles these days with the equipment mm -hmm. that we have on the airplane, both the strategic and the tactical side of things. So that really was uh, our our primary mission in Afghanistan and Iraq was was those two um uh, those two different types of uh, intelligence and uh, intelligence gathering. And did you ever feel at risk, you know, from threats from the enemy or even threats from the airframe limitations when you were over in them operations? Uh, you know, we we were we were very fortunate um, in the Middle Eastern conflict to be operating in a relatively uncontested environment. Right. You know, we we are dealing with mostly uh, individuals uh, on the ground that don't really have the capability to, you know, reach uh, the U-2. Mm -hmm. There are other uh, operating areas around the world where um, that, that, that we fly in where there are, you know, folks that do have more capability than than uh, the folks we were dealing with in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but the uh, honestly the airplane is what will bite you more often than not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the, uh, to be honest with you, some of the, the most um, challenging aspects of that airplane, there's a region of Northeastern Afghanistan that a lot of people refer to as Nixon's nose. Um, mm -hmm. It's an area where Pakistan kind of juts out and there's some, some very, very tall mountains out there. And in the wintertime, especially the, uh, high altitude turbulence that is created uh, from the rotors and and mountain wave uh, out in that direction can really um, be dangerous to even us, you know, up at our, our operating altitudes. Mm -hmm. And when you're operating with airspeed, you know, and maneuvering margins that are so tight mm -hmm. uh, and so narrow at those altitudes, when you start to encounter high altitude turbulence like that, all of a sudden your airspeed starts to bounce around and you're going from an overspeed to a stall situation almost instantaneously. And, you know, control of the airplane uh, can really become very, very challenging. Yeah. Uh, and in order to, to really have a good grasp on being able to control the airplane, you'll need to descend, which can interfere with the intelligence that you're trying to collect at that point. And there's all of these second and third order effects of actually having to come down in altitude from this turbulence. The imagery that you're trying to collect might not necessarily be what they want. So, um, so in Northeastern Afghanistan specifically, high altitude turbulence was actually a big, um, a big problem. Um, and then, uh, uh, the airplane itself was a spatial D monster in instrument conditions, meaning, uh, you know, you could 
because of the adverse yaw of the airplane. The wings are so long and there's so much rudder that's needed as you're making your way in turns. If you are getting vectored and, and you know, a lot of course changes and altitude changes and corrections in weather conditions, especially when you're in the spacesuit, um, the, the feelings on the body don't necessarily match what you're seeing on the mm. screens. And um, for me personally, I have never been more spatially disoriented than flying that airplane in, in instrument conditions. So uh, out in the Middle East, for example, you'd get a lot of sandstorms where visibility was significantly reduced. And there were some days where the sun angle and everything was just right, where it would be very visually disorienting, uh, you know, flying that airplane, um, uh, bringing it in. So. Uh, honestly, <laughs> that, that was usually what we were more concerned about, uh, were things like that when we were, when we were flying around. Um, so, well, Joel, it sounds like you had an amazing time on the U2 and I have to say I'm very jealous. I mean, you get to see the curvature of the earth, uh, but before we wrap up, uh, the U2 part of the interview, uh, can you share maybe like one story that sticks out in your mind from flying the U2? Um, probably so many, but uh, just maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> well, really what, what I found most rewarding about, uh, you know, flying the airplane was, I mean, not only, of course, it's an incredible airplane. It's so unique. It's a, it's a, it's a, an incredible uh, brotherhood, you know, to be a, a part of, it's a part of, of history. My favorite part of flying the airplane was about, um, making history. Uh, some of the things that we were able to be a part of, and I, I can't get into specifics about yeah. what it was, but to be able to, you know, operate on a mission, be able to watch and see something unfold. And based on the intelligence that we were able to collect, you know, be able to, um, you know, provide that to the end user. And the next day on the news, being able to see the president of the United States, or the Secretary of State, you know, announcing, you know, to the world uh, something that I was able to do, you know, be a, a, a part of. That was uh, that was was very very special, and that happened on more than one occasion. Um, so so, you know, from from that standpoint, it was very very special. And and like you said, seeing the curvature of the Earth, um, that is something that is very difficult to convey. How mm. special. Uh, that is to be able to see the planet from that height, that altitude, and understand really how small you know we all are in in the grand scheme of things. It really oh. does change your perspective on 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 just life in general. Um, so very very honored and very uh, thankful that I was able to participate in in something like that. That's awesome. And uh, so, how many hours did you get on the YouTube, Joel? Just shy of 800 hours uh, flying the U-2 over the course of, you know, between 2013 and 2017. Very lucky, man. But uh, we've got some personal questions here for you, Joel, if you're happy to oh, answer boy. them. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Nothing, nothing taxing here. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. So, Joel, do you have any hobbies apart from aviation? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm an avid scuba diver. Uh, absolutely love diving, been diving all around the world. Um, uh, and, uh, big skier as well. Um, we are fortunate to live close, you know, to, uh, to the Lake Tahoe area here in Northern California. So, uh, always out there skiing. Um, and also, uh, uh, uh aviation is uh, still a big part of my life, even though, you know, I do it professionally. Uh, I also do it in my, my personal life. I have two of my own airplanes. I have a Vans RV6, and I also have a, a, a little J3 Cub, a Very little nice. yellow one. Uh, so have a blast flying those things around. Um, we do a lot of uh, formation flying with, uh, with those airplanes. And, uh, and also, um, uh, I participate in an organization called the, uh, the Patriots Jet Team. Uh, here in, in Northern California, it's a, it's a very unique, um, group of folks. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Breitling team, the L39 yeah, like team. You fly the L39s, is that correct? I do. Yeah. yeah. So 
Uh, the Patriots jet team is very similar to the Breitling jet team in terms yeah. of they are a, a, a six ship L39 uh, demonstration team doing mm -hmm. air shows all around the West Coast. But we also do all kinds of, of other stuff. Um, we have an upset training program that we operate and, and corporate pilots will come in and and uh, they will go through the upset training course as part of their uh, training requirements. So I, I had a hand in um, in developing that program wow. and uh, and flying with and flying with that. Uh, and then um, uh, even more recently, uh, the the Patriots, uh, in partnership with a company called Helenet Aviation out of uh, Southern California, uh, and Shotover, who makes um, uh, who makes uh, gyro stabilized uh, camera gimbals. Uh, a couple years ago, we we um, the, the the Patriots um, created a camera system that allowed us to operate at um, the highest uh, performance uh, levels of just about any aerial cinematography platform out there. Wow. And I think uh, it's it's pretty much public information now with the the release of the the trailers and whatnot that mm -hmm. uh, the Patriots in co in cooperation with Helenet. Uh, were the uh, the primary aerial, aerial cinematography unit for the new Top Gun movie. Wow, um, that's impressive, isn't it? Yeah, so so that's going to be a lot of fun to see more of that uh, unfold. Um, Kevin LaRosa, who's uh, one of the aerial coordinators for Helenet, had a big part in uh, in um, uh, making all of that happen. And uh, Randy Howell, the owner of the team, he was uh, he was uh, one of the primary players in that as well. And uh, what a fun project uh, that was to be. Uh, oh, I can imagine. Today. I can imagine. Yeah. But uh, can we find any of these projects online, social media, Twitter, Facebook, anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. You can go um, to the Patriots Jet Team. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, PatriotsJetTeam.org. Mm -hmm. And they also have a foundation, PatriotsJetTeamFoundation.org. Uh, and they're a wonderful organization. Uh, the owner has... Um, for the last 20 years has really been involved in giving back to the aviation community and providing uh, education and scholarships for oh, awesome. young kids between 13 and 17 years old. Uh, we provide scholarships for them to go to ground school, to be able to solo, and also a couple full private pilot scholarships, as well as offering classes that they can attend. And I am a guest speaker along with a handful of other folks that will uh, uh, talk to these um, talk to these classes about careers in aviation, how to get into it, and try and you know mentor those that that are really interested in in um, uh, having a career in aviation. So, uh, yeah, uh, pjtf.org if you'd like to check out the uh, the foundation, and then you can go to cinejet.com um, to learn about the uh, the uh, filming aspect of uh, of the Patriots. So, so that's a lot of fun. I've been uh, involved with that program for about four years now, and uh, that has been one of the most rewarding things that I've been a part of outside of uh, you know professional flying. Awesome. Well, we will link all them in the description box and everything so you guys can check it out. But one last question for you, Joel, and this could be a toughie, but uh, favorite aircraft you have ever flown? Favorite airplane I have ever flown? Well, you know, <laughs> I've flown a lot of different airplanes, but nothing is going to compare to the U-2. To be honest with you, that is the most unique, the most special. I can remember on my very last flight uh, in the U-2, just sitting there, I was over San Francisco at, you know, 70 plus thousand feet, just overlooking the ocean, overlooking the entire expanse of, of Northern California. And, um, you know, I didn't have to be upside down, inverted, pulling nine Gs, you know, just being there and seeing the world from that perspective and that standpoint, uh, I can very clearly remember the moment where I was just sitting there saying to myself, this has been such an incredible honor. And this is something that I will remember for the rest of my life. So um, I, I genuinely, the, the U2 takes the cake. Of course, yeah. So Joel, thank you very much for giving up your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and hear about your amazing flying career. I mean, flying, flying U2 and seeing the curvature to the earth. What more could you want as a pilot? It was uh, it was pretty incredible. Thanks so much for having me on. It's been uh, been a lot of fun chatting, and uh, and thank you. Cheers, Joel.